this new addition. Also, I need a pizza, I think. I didn't add time to eat something. I think I'm just gonna order a pizza. I can order one from here and send it to you. It'll probably take maybe a week or two to get it. With ICPs? You think you yes, can, you think absolutely. you can find some someone? Absolutely. Now with ID geek, why not? <laughs> that reminds me of something. Okay. Uh, I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, I heard that story before as well. I think we're good to go. So uh, this is a lecture on uh, Motoko, variables, types, functions, and groups. So this is very uh, important. A lot of basic concept, but that's the concept that you will need for the for this week. Uh, once again, this is going to be available on YouTube as soon as uh, the live is done and the recording and the the recording is processed by YouTube. Good video. Welcome to Variables, Types, Functions, and Loops. I'm Ted Reinhardt. I'm excited to be part of this uh, Motoko Boot Camp. I started with uh, the ICP about two years ago, learning about the at the Genesis event, and I'm based in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. So we're going to focus on building a small job quote system for flooring. This is just going to be the Motoko backend. And the uh, information that we'll be gathering will be about the area of a room to generate a quote, which is going to sh show the area, the product cost, the install cost, and who the estimator was. And uh, it'll generate a quote number for each quotation that we do. So let's get into it. But before that, just want to remind you that you can pause this video at any time if you need more time to explore because some of these things I'll be going through fairly quickly. Thank you. So the first thing we need to do is to import the modules from the base library. We're going to deal with integers and I'll explain more about that in a second. And also we're going to need to bring in the floating point library. So then we'll start to define define the actor, which will be an estimator. We need to store some information, and we use variables to do so. There are four things you need to understand about variables. The first is how to declare a dynamic variable, and we use the reserved word var, which is short for variable. We provide a static name so that we can reference the variable easily, in this case, flooring area. And then we declare the static type that's going to hold, in this case, float, which is Motoko's floating point type. Float are numbers that can have decimal values. The syntax requires a colon before the type. And by using equal sign and followed by the value, we can provide the initial value and complete the declaration. The second thing is how to assign a value after the declaration has been made. In this case, we want to assign the flooring area, the results of the calculation length times width. And the colon equal is the assignment operator. The third thing is the immutable variable. Sometimes you want to declare a variable with a value that will never change. Using the let reserved word instead of var ensures that the variable is immutable. And last is the use of stable variables. By adding the reserved word stable in front of the var reserved word, it ensures that the variable is not overwritten or reset when a canister is being upgraded. This is particularly useful uh, for counters, such as the quotation number, to ensure they are not reset. I'm going to use uh, four, four variables here. I'm going to set up a stable variable for the quotation number, so quotation 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, stable will be preserved between upgrades. It's part of the orthogonal persistence that the system ICP provides. 
and I'm also going to have uh, the product cost and ICP as being a stable variable. I'm going to set it initially to 2. And then I need two more variables, one for the flooring area, which will be a float, a floating point number. I'll set that to 0 just for the declaration. And I only have uh, one estimator, and his name is Bob. So I'm just going to set it in a immutable uh, variable, text variable, called Bob. So next, we're going to need a function that's going to calculate the area uh, based on the length and the width. And those are both floating point numbers. And that function is going to return a floating point number as well. And you'll see, as I type this out, uh, everything's got type float for flotation, or for a floating point, sorry. And I'll do the calculation of the floor area. And that will actually return, uh, the function will return uh, floor area. Let's pause the coding for a moment and look at the function declaration. So functions are a way to package up the logic and to perform a task as a unit. Functions can be public, which are exposed and accessible outside of the canister, or they can be private for use only within the canister. Using the public reserve word makes it public. And if you do not put the public reserve word, the function will only be accessible internally. Declaring a function requires a static name and inside the parenthesis are the arguments that you want to pass to the function. In this case, length and width are the arguments and you must specify the type that they're going to handle, float in this case. And notice the colon async float before the curly brace. Uh, this is where you specify the function's return value, in this case, float. Async indicates that this can be performed asynchronously. You do not have to wait for completion. And the logic of a function is uh, included within the curly braces. You can also declare a function as a public query function. This is done when the function is not writing to the blockchain and does not require consensus. As a result, query functions are much faster and also a function can return no arguments and this is indicated to, by two parentheses which you will see a little bit later. So now that we've got that all set up we can actually uh, create the estimate because I've got the function now with to calculate the area and I've got the cost uh, in, in there and a quotation number. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, I'll define the create estimate function and it's just going to return the text of the actual quote and then I'm going to bump up the quotation number because I want to keep track of how many quotations I've done. And that's part of the orthogonal persistence with the stable variable. And then I'm going to just format um, what the estimate actually looks like. So here I'm just going to have the quotation number um, and, the, uh, and I will concatenate it to a function of the quotation number, but I need it in text. So I'm going to grab it from the uh, import of the int module. That's why the int dot two text is there. And then you'll notice that to each time I'm have a cross hatch and the next value. And that's just I'm concatenating all these uh, fields together um, or text strings so that I can put them out as the estimate at the end. And uh, because I want to convert from float uh, to text, I have to call it from the float module for these other ones. And at the end of that, I will return the estimate. So the last thing I want to do is have a little function here just to set the cost in case the cost changes away from the two ICP. So in order to do that, I just define a function that's going to accept a new cost, which is also a floating point number. And it's not going to return anything. It's just going to set it. But it's going to update the production cost and ICP, the stable variable, with the new cost. And... Uh, So I have saved my file and I'm going to deploy this. I have my replica started. So I'm going to do my DFX deploy. Okay. 
Now that the canister has been deployed, let's look at the candid uh, user interface. And right here we go. We've got the three functions, calculate area, create estimate, and set costs. So if we were to say a room is 10 meters by 20 meters, it will calculate the area. And we can see the output here, the response that's returned, and also in the log. So if I want to create an estimate, I can just click on call and it will use the base cost of 2ICP that we defined. And here you can see it's the first quote estimated by Bob and it's uh, 200 square meters at a cost of uh, 2ICP per square meter and the total cost. Now if I were to if I was to set the cost and say that it was uh, 5 ICP, I could update that. And you'll see over here, it just responds with a uh, uh, an empty response just because we didn't ask for an arg a reply, a return value. Um, and then if I go and do the create estimate again, this one will be done at the 5 ICP level. So of course the cost is much higher. It's now 1000 ICP for the total area. And that's it. Now let's circle back to talk about types a little bit more. We've already shown uh, how to declare a variable uh, including its type. And we've done the same for arguments to functions and the return values. So we've got a good idea of how to, to do that. So Matoko is in fact a type safe language. It requires that we declare the type for variables, arguments, and functions. We just mentioned that. Um, and if you're using VS Code with the Motoko language service, or uh, if you're using the Motoko Playground, you'll notice that you will get feedback when mismatched types are entered. So for example, here I'm showing that uh, we're going to assign the estimator name um, the uh, the value Bob, but I've declared it as a float. And of course, Bob is not a floating point number. So the um, integrated development environment will throw a warning up saying that uh, text does not have the expected uh, type of float, obviously. Let's say we save the file and compiled it. Well, the compiler will then enforce the uh, type safety. It would fail to compile, and it would also throw an error saying that uh, text does not have the expected type float. So in the previous examples, we used the text int and float types. Uh, we did that in the little program that we wrote up. Um, Motoko has several other primitive types as well, and several with different precisions like the integer has integer 8 16 32 and 64 as does nat um, I suggest you pause the video and just look through the definitions of these primitive types uh, at your own pace and here is an example of some of the values that can be stored in these types again pause the video if you so desire I've included some sample declarations just so that you can see how easy it is to declare variables of different types uh, with their initial value. Uh, and note that instead of a comma, the underscore is used as a separator for larger values. Each primitive type also has a corresponding module in the base library. Most modules provide functions that can manipulate variables of the type and convert between certain types. Also, um, a module may define some values. So for example, the float module, by importing it with the import float followed by the mo colon base slash float package a module name, the functions are associated with the name float. So in this case, I wanted to use the sin function and the value of pi. 
And by doing the import float, it means that all the functions and values in the module can be referenced using float and the function name or function um, dot value. Sorry, not function, I should say float dot value. Take a look at the syntax for float.sin as an example. So I happen to pick float as an example. All types have corresponding modules with functions and some also have values. And take a peek at all these functions for the primitive types. There's a lot of them. The primitive types are just the beginning. Matoko builds upon those types to provide more complex types and functions found in corresponding modules. So these types will be the subject of other videos, but array, hash map, buffer, and iter type are heavily used. Here on the internetcomputer.org website is your gateway to the documentation about Matoko. So I'll just hit search here. And I'll, uh, just for fun, I'm going to type um, type float. And here I'm just going to bring up the page about the type float. And uh, what you have is a definition for the type as well as uh, all of the functions and values that are available through the, the float module. Um, as well as over here, you've got all the different types. So you can just click on, let's say if you want to understand what int could provide, click on here, you see all the functions. You can go down and gain access to all the information. So it's, it's a really cool site. It's a, a great spot to start. I'm going to show you how a loop works. So to do this, we're going to define an actor called looper. I'm going to use a variable called counter, which we'll just be using for counting one, two, three, four, five, six upwards. And I'll define a, a function, which will take as an argument the number of times. I'm just going to call it a repeat function. And the loop will just augment the counter by one. And it's going to check to see if the counter is greater or equal to the number of times that I pass as an argument. If it does, it's going to return counter. And if not, it's going to keep on counting. So now let's deploy our canister. This will take a minute or two. I've had deployed it once before, but I'm going to just uh, do it again. I like Matoko Playground, great place to learn. So here you go, you can see in the candidate interface that it's asking me to provide a value for the repeat uh, public query function that I have over here. I am just going to give it a number. So let's say 
repeat it 789 times. It's going to go through the loop right here and augment the loop each time. It's going to check to see if the counter is greater or either equal to the number of times I specify here. And lo and behold, it's gone and executed that. So that's basically what a loop does. Goes forever, uh, and then you have to break out of your loop. So I'm going to create an actor. I'll just call it a while loop uh, demo. And in here, I will um, initialize the counter, set it to zero, and then I'm going to define a function. But note that I'm using the while loop. And the while loop has a condition in there that says counter is less than 10. So while is a conditional loop, it'll only execute if the condition is true. So you'll notice here I've says say while counter is less than 10, and if so, just augment the counter by one and continue doing that until the counter is equal to 10 and then return counter. So we'll deploy that. Take a second. Then we can see the candid interface here. I'm just going to press the query button and if you note on the function there's actually no arguments to it so I'm just going to activate it and it should go through and check to see if the counter is less than 10 and if it is it'll augment the counter of course we start with the counter being zero there you go so now we're going to look at optional values and uh, to do this we're going to use the uh, hello world example in the Motoko playground it's a nice short example but it's going to be suitable for our purposes so just to uh, recap this particular uh, DAP will say something that we tell it to say. So it's almost like an echo function. We provide a value uh, which gets stored in phrase and it echoes it back uh, on the, uh, the screen when we're using the candid interface. Um, however, I don't want to always have to say something. So sometimes I just would like to call the function say with no arguments at all and I like it to return a standard greeting. So I'm going to actually put in a standard greeting for fun. And that's going to be of type text. And I'm going to say something like hello. There we go. So there is my standard greeting with all these wonderful uh, greetings. And I would like to um, use that in this sentence or in this uh, function. So the scoop here is that I sometimes don't want to have to say a phrase, but because I've declared phrase as being type text, it always has to have a value um, because of the type. But there is something called an optional value that we can use, and we can use that for any type declaration, and it's really simple to use. When we want to say, when we want to not have to provide a value to a variable, we can use the question mark in front of the type declaration and that means it's an optional type so the phrase now is an optional type text and that means that it can also hold a null now as soon as we do that you'll notice that the return phrase is now going to be uh, showing an error and the reason why is because in this function we're saying that the function is going to return type text but we've declared phrase as being optional type text so a 
error here is going to say that the expression of type optional text cannot produce the expected type of text. So up here, we're going to have to say we want a return value of optional text. So now we're able to call this function and put in uh, the word that we want to get it to say or put in nothing. But in the case of when we put in nothing, I would like to be able to have it return the standard greeting. So it's much quicker that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to handle um, the case of the phrase being uh, uh, null or not by using a command called switch. We're using the keyword switch. And here I'm going to do a switch on the word phrase or on the variable phrase. And if the phrase one of these situations is going to be in the case where the phrase is null, return the value standard greeting. And in the case where, and these are just patterns uh, that I'm matching, so this means uh, in every other case where there's a value, return the actual phrase that I provide it. And now we don't have to use this return because we've handled the two cases. And the other thing is when I'm returning uh, the standard greeting, of course standard greeting is of type text and it needs an optional type text so I'm going to just return it with the optional value in front and now this is going to work so I will deploy this Now over here, if I were to say, because now this is an optional text, I have to tick this to say something. So I'm going to say, because it's no longer an option, I'm actually going to fill it out. Um, so I'm going to say, uh, I'll say it in Italian. And then you can see it echoes back, buongiorno. If I say nothing, it's going to go and it's going to hit this null during the switch. It's going to evaluate it and it's going to return the standard greeting, which it did. Hello, bonjour, hola, hola, uh, ni hao, and uh, kamusta. So there you go. That is how to use an optional uh, value by using the question mark in front of the type. Now, just for fun, if we were going to use a variable that is going to be optional, let's say variable um, age, and it's going to be of type not. We were going to say it was 35, 30 years of age. That's quite straightforward. But if we were going to say that it's a, a uh, optional not where it could be also null when you're assigning uh, or in this case we're declaring a value you would have to declare it with the optional in front of it and then later on if you were going to do an assignment and say age is equal to uh, 55 again you cannot do that you would have to put in the optional in front to make sure that the, the type is matching. So there you go. So there's your quick intro to optional values.
That was a great one. Okay, so uh, I think we have a few questions. We only have one right now. <laughs> so maybe we'll just do live coding. Uh, so let me see the chat. I wanted to do, yeah, this video will be dropped on YouTube. There was a question about, um, so I think. There's a question about random. Yeah. Can I just show that or can, do you want to show it in Matoko? Yeah, I'm trying to go for the playground to do some demo. Yeah. Just a hello world will work great. So. Can't we zoom? Yeah, you can. can we, oh, you're on a Mac. Yeah, it looks like it's removing the, well, that's not too much of a problem, I think. Okay, so let's start with random. Uh, actually, that's not the easiest one to make a demo. No, I, the when I'm, the <laughs> random that was being asked about wasn't the random IC module, it was, I. Uh, if you if you can just load up the um, uh, the the say uh, the greeting in the Toko uh, playground, just reload that That's page from your from your lecture, right? No, you just reload that page right there. Okay, and, wait. Uh, which one? The one that you're on. Just hit reload. Yeah. And just choose the uh, hello world. Yeah, yeah, just choose that one. And just apply it. Ah, okay. It's uh, from the candidate. Okay. Yeah. So I think the question was about the candid user interface that they'll see that there's an option with random in there. And what does that mean? So we'll. Okay, it's deploying. There you go. So normally we would put a text in here to say something, let's say, say hello, um, or hi, there you go. And then that would give you your output. But if you were to click random, that just populates a random value in that field, uh, typically. Yeah. And uh, it saves you having to type entries, that's all. So that's what that one is. It's basically if you if you don't have uh, too much Im imagination, if you just want a quick uh, quick save thing. some typing. Do you want to share your screen, Ted? Maybe or you uh, you are okay with me doing? doing I'm anything? okay with. Uh, I, it's like having a power tool. You're a, a Superman on doing this, so you can you can share your screen. <laughs> okay, that's great. So. Yeah, I wanted to demo something. I had a question about the, um, so it was the unit type. So the question was, can we return a function that returns nothing? And yes. So let's say you have a function like this, uh, which take a text and returns, well, nothing. And we'll just, uh, Let's say something like this. So you have a variable. This is a mutable variable because it's, it's a var. And let's put it to hello. And now you want to change the message. So message is equal to T, but you don't want to return anything. So you can just let it like this. And this is the type that you, you will use. So I, I hope it answers the question. This is the, um, the unit type and yeah. And also one thing is that you don't need to always put the return. So actually this function is the same as this one. So yeah, just a little, little detail. Yes, Motoko let would be JavaScript const, yes. And Motoko bar would be var and let yeah motoko var would be like a let um and 
Motocall Lite would be like a JavaScript const. Yeah. When can we use the blob and principal data types? So let's start with the principal. It's a very important type. We can import it like this principal at Motocall base. And a principal is an identity. So uh, it's actually a very important type and you could do something like uh, if you want to know, for example, with this syntax. So this is a bit more advanced than what we've seen so far. You can get the caller. So the person that is calling this function, um, let's say, who are my, it will return the principal. And this is just gonna return the color. So we can do like this, return color. In this case, it would be a principal. So let's try to deploy that. I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be anonymous, right? Because it it's should from, be. the, from the playground, so it should be. But yeah. So this is the principle that we have right now from the, the, the Motoko playground. This is actually a special principle. It's um, the anonymous identity because we are not logging right now. But whenever you log in, for example, on the, on the dashboard, when you log in with the internet identity, you have a specific principle assigned to you. And this is how you can know like your users and uh, store your users like this. So yeah, uh, this is how you would use the principle, the principle type. The blob, you would use it for like images or binary data, anything of that sort. I don't know, maybe Ted, you have more like examples where they could use blob, but. I use it to import wave files that I want to edit. Um, so uh, it's just a, a large string of binary uh, values. Um, so you can put whatever you want in a blob. So sometimes yeah. a base 64 um image is stored as a blob um yeah how can i return not a number in the case of division by zero return not a number does not work okay so you could do something like so let's say uh let's say you want to do a div so public function div and uh, i think it's you have a counter which is like maybe 10 and you want to div to divide this counter by whatever value you put here uh and you want to make sure that in the case of division by zero you don't return anything because it's uh it's not valuable it's not it's not possible so you would do something like this. Um, if n is equal to zero, then I return null. Or maybe you would do something different right now because, well, otherwise counter uh, would be counter divided by n. You do something like this, for example. Um, yeah, and then return counter. But if you do that, if you do just counter and you've listened to the to the lecture of Ted, so you see that this is not a good type. This is type not, and we want type optional not. So we have to put the interrogation mark here. And yeah, you could do something like this to like replace the not a number. Uh, there is also other possibilities like uh, assertion, for example, could be used here. Explain then null and the switch. Um, where was the then? There was a then at some point. I don't think I saw that. Maybe I can just explain the the switch. So the switch in Motoko very important. 
we can also yeah we can also do that so um let's say you have um this value of type of type not so n and you want to actually switch n because you want to make sure that if n is equal to zero or n is equal to yeah you want to make sure that if n is equal to zero then you return null as we as we've done before so you could do something like this k is zero return null this is gonna return null and if n is not zero then you can do something like uh case all other case you could i think you could do something like this it's maybe not the best example but let's do it and then counter counter divided by n then return the counter and optional counter so you could do something like this with the switch case a better example for the switch case would be maybe like uh, if you have a type variant so we will see that later it's a type uh, let's say public type days then you could have but they could be Monday or could be uh, Tuesday or it could be Wednesday, so uh, and so on. This is what we call a variant type, and it's a type that can be one of those values. So it could be Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or so on. Uh, and then you could do a switch. Uh, let's say print message will return a text and it takes a day and you could switch on the day and this would be very much like in the spirit of Motoko so like for example case Monday so you switch the day uh, it's so like this case Monday or case Tuesday our case Wednesday so yeah like this and here you could do something like return happy Monday nice Tuesday and so on and so um, in the case where you have other types so let's say uh, you also have um, Thursday, for example, and Friday. Then you could, if you don't want to write like all the cases, um, a switch case always need to have like all the values. So like, for example, here we can see that we have an error because it says this switch of type Friday, Monday, Thursday, Tuesday does not cover those values. This is because imagine you have a day of type Thursday or type of Friday, then the switch is not complete. Complete, so you need a backup, and you can write all the cases, but you can also do this. And someone asked the question, "What does this symbol mean?" It's basically uh, all the other case. So could do. something like this uh, have a nice day and this would cover all the cases that we have okay so i'm gonna move to next question is it possible to to show an example of a stable variable so yes let's do it Oops.
Okay, so we have set counter. This is gonna set the counter to the value we provide and then return the counter. You're going to do the same with a stable counter. Then this is going to show the counter. So we can do just this, return counter and return stable counter. Um, yeah, very important thing. I, I didn't emphasize enough. It's the difference between the query and the update function. So by default, the function is an update function. The query function is a function that just look and doesn't change anything. If you want to modify the state, so if you modify a variable or yeah, any, any variable or any data structure, you have to use update call and those are much longer because they go to the consensus of the internet computer. Whereas the query call are very fast and they don't go to consensus. So you can answer in like a few, a few milliseconds. Okay, so let's deploy this. So let's set our counter to 10, set our stable counter to 10 as well. As you can see, update call takes uh, two to three seconds. This one took three seconds, this one two seconds. Then we can show the counter, so it's 10, and it's very fast to answer a query call. Then we go there, and also very fast, and it's also 10. Now we want to reintroduce something, maybe the message, and we want to do another deployment. So we upgrade the canister. We change the WebAssembly module inside. And now if we go and check the, the stable counter, this is still 10 because a stable variable is, is uh, kept across upgrades. But if we go there, the counter is reset to zero. Uh, the counter is reset to the value that we set here. So this is the difference between stable variable and normal variable. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. We need to return float in our div function. Uh, should be optional float. So I'm gonna gonna check that after this this lecture. Let me look at the chat if we have other questions. What means interrogation mark? Can you repeat? Yes. So the um, okay, maybe it's not good. So the optional mark means that it could be but let's say your canister stores uh stores a message like this, and you have a function that enables you to change the message. So um, like this, and then return the message. Uh, yeah. So of course, the, um, the interrogation mark basically means that this variable is of type optional text and the type optional text is either null or a text. So this is basically used to make sure that in case you don't have a text, maybe this is not the best example, but if you have a value, sometimes you will not be sure that you have uh, always this value. So you will need to use the optional value to uh, for a return type, for example. Um, yeah, it's it's maybe not the best example right now often, often in lists for example uh, let's say if we had a list of people um, who had bicycles um, and you put the type of bicycle that they had 
um, maybe I don't have a bicycle. So you could still collect the information, but it would be optional for me to put that. Or if I had a list of people who own pet snakes, I do not own a pet snake. So I could not put the name of my pet snake in the list. Yeah, for example, maybe you want to uh, create a type student. That's a better example, a type type students and they are they have a name um maybe they have a school but you're not sure about that so you put the optional mark um yeah so bicycles uh students also sometimes when you when you look into a data structure you you are not sure that you will find uh whatever type you're expecting so you use the optional optional value The quotation mark means type optional. You use it for the type, but not for the value. Um, the value the question is, mark, yeah. 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 Interrogation mark is the, the value is null or a value of type text. But um, there, is, um, there is an entire uh, section on the optional value. I don't think you need that for day one anyway. Is it possible to implement unit testing? Yes, it is. Uh, there are a few libraries that do that. Uh, do that. Uh, I'll provide more links for that. It's in my to-do list for the test. We also have um, some news on the on the testing on Motoko. There is a past graduate who, we, who created um, a library for for Motoko that can be used for for testing. So we still have five minutes. I think I'm gonna just do like a quick recap of what we've seen. So um, first thing was the types, then the variables, then the functions and the loops. So quick recap in Motoko, uh, each variable has a type, for example, Let's uh, mentor of type text called Ted. So uh, value has always uh, a variable has always a type. In this case, it's of type text, and you can mention the type with the the symbol. And you can also do it for like, let's say, age. Let not. Uh, and then I'm gonna put twenty five. <laughs> And uh, you could also do it for is um, is tired. You could do bull for false or true. So you have a lot of different types. Uh, but in Motoko, each variable has a type. Then the variables we have the var and the let, and so the var are like this. Uh, var name is equal to Ted let uh, name. So this is mutable name and this is immutable. The difference is that you can change this one. You can reassign it. So for example, you could do name mutable, um, let's say uh, Isaac, you could do something like this. Whereas you cannot do that for the let. So if you try to do it will not work. You would say expected mutable assignment target. So yeah, you cannot reassign a variable with let. Then we have the functions. So public and private, but you can remove the private keyword usually. And this is how you define a function. Um, let's say show age takes no argument and it returns a not, which is the age in this case. You can use a return like this, or you can just uh, you can just put age because in this case Motoko always returns the latest evaluated value. So in this case, it would be age. The function can be public and it can be also a query or an update. By default, it's going to be an update. So if you put query, um, if you put if you put query, it's going to be a query. Otherwise, it's going to be an update. And then. You can also have a private function, but you can also just do it like this. Um, show tired. 
um, yeah, an important distinction that I think I forgot to mention is that a function that is not public is um, there is not the keyword async. So this is explained in the guides. Uh, I think I'm going to explain it also in the in the next sessions and in the in the mentorship session. But basically, it's because the internal canister, like the the outside world of the canister, needs to know about uh, whether it has to wait or not. The async means that the person has to wait for an answer when coding this function. Uh, but the internal canister, of course, when it's working with himself and just coding his own functions, it doesn't need to to wait. It can just execute the functions. Uh, but yeah, once again, it's going to be explained more in the in the guides. And then we have the loop, and I think you showed the for loop and the while loop. Right. Uh, so yeah. Uh, you also have um, you have different ways to to do a loop. I don't know if I could do something like I like using iter. So those are iterators uh, for e in iter dot range say zero to ten i. Uh, this is going to uh, this is going to to be Let's say, uh, I don't have a good example right now. I think my brain is a bit fried right now, but <laughs> uh, yeah, this is this is how you would do a loop. Uh, we have that in the guide as well. And uh, this is um, this is an iterator explained tomorrow in in the in the lecture. Do you have a last question? There's a question the question about query. Oh yes, why is the show age uh, of type func and not query if age age is not changed? Uh, just just because um, an a query can also be an update. Like if you have a function that just look, you can use a query or an update if you want. Uh, the other way around wouldn't work though. So if you have like something that modifies the state, you cannot do a query. Actually, let's try it out. If you do public query and then uh, let's modify the name. So let's return change name. Let's name mutable. So yeah, this is not gonna work. Expression. Uh, this is because yeah. Oh wait, why is it working? Oh yeah, uh, my brain. I think I'm, I'm a bit tired there. Uh, it can work, but it's not gonna be, like it's not gonna be taken into account. Like it's it's just gonna be temporary, and it's not gonna change the state in any case. But uh, yeah, I I use um an update for a query, which is possible. The other way around is also possible, but doesn't have the same effect. Line 10 is a declaration. Yes. Uh, line line 9, I think now. And line 10 is an assignment. Yes. OK. So, so when you do your iteration, as Seb, uh, yeah. you were doing it uh, with a range of 0 to 10. Question is, is 10 included? Is 10 included? Yes, it's, it's not. It is not. Yeah, it's uh, going to start at zero and it's gonna do it 10 times. So zero, one, and so on until nine. Yeah, it's not, it's not included. It's. I think it's consistent with like what they're what people are expecting. Okay. Well, I'll publish the recording as soon as possible on YouTube. And uh I'm just gonna do a break. I think my brain is like out of function, right? But uh, I'm gonna go back on Discord tonight to help a few people. So I'm gonna be in the in the voice channel. See you there, guys. Have a good Thanks, night. Sir.
Bye.